my life figured out by the time I was eight years old. I was going to be a motivational speaker, an author, and I was going to live in Maine and be a lobster woman. <laughs> I had no doubt that it was going to happen. I believed these dreams with everything in me. And yet, the odds weren't really in my favor. I grew up in poverty, in inner city Minneapolis. Bad stuff happened. I was never the cool kid, and I never fit in. But we had something that my neighbors didn't. We had motivational tapes. And my dad listened to him constantly. He had little motivational quotes hanging all over the house and the car. And at night, he would tuck my sister and I into bed and play these tapes on auto rewind. <laughs> I can still remember crawling in my little North Minneapolis bungalow in my little twin bed, pulling the covers up to my chin and hearing Zig Ziglar tell me, he'd see me at the top. The funny thing is, it's been almost 40 years since I first heard Zig. And I've heard hundreds of great motivational speakers since that time. But the thing is, I don't remember their how-tos. their seven simple steps. And I don't remember their magical formulas for change. What I do remember are their stories. Their stories inspired me. Their stories encouraged me to dream big dreams. Their stories gave me hope. And the thing about their stories was, it didn't matter what story I heard. I heard the same message. The message I heard was, do not give up. By the time I got to high school, I had given up. And those positive tapes that I had heard, the messages that I heard from Zig, were a thing of the past. And what replaced them were negative tapes. Tapes that told me, you're a loser. You'll never amount to anything. And who do you think you are to be successful? These negative tapes were powerful. And as the result of giving in to them and listening to them, I got asked to leave high school. I was sent to St. Cloud's Alternative School, the school otherwise known as the school for the burnouts and the pregnant girls. I remember showing up that first day. I had on my black leather jacket, my Metallica t-shirt, my heavy black eyeliner, and an attitude this big. And as I stood outside smoking with my friends, we laughed and we joked that while we might be burnouts, at least we weren't the pregnant girls. <laughs> the next year, I returned pregnant. And I was not laughing. I had sunk to an all-time low. I had become that girl. And the tapes that tried to convince me I was a loser no longer had to. I knew it. Interesting, as I attended that alternative school, they saw something in me. And later that year, they came to me and said, Michelle, we've chosen you. We've chosen you to win a scholarship to attend a local community college the next fall. I couldn't believe they chose me. Did they not know I was a loser, a misfit, a burnout? And yet I heard Zig saying, do not give up. So I said, yes, I would go to college. And then I freaked out. How would I go to college? How would I be a single mom and go to school and get an education and overcome this poverty and this darkness that I had lived? But I quickly forgot about going to college because I was having a baby. The labor pains came on the morning of March 8th, and they hurt. They tried to tell me, they tried to warn me that it would hurt, but I had no idea they would hurt so badly. By the time I got to the hospital, I acted like a typical 16-year-old. 
I screamed and swore and yelled, I don't want to do this anymore. The thing about labor is, the only way out is through. <laughs> I have found that is also true in my life. That the only way out of a life that I don't want or into dreams that I do is through. I made it through labor. And as the result, I had a son. He was perfect. And I was in love immediately. I remember after the hustle and bustle of the birth, everyone went home that night. And the hospital was really quiet. And I went to his bassinet and I picked up Brandon. And that little flicker of hope that had begun to return at the alternative school burst into flames that night. And something came over me. In the quiet of the, the hospital that night, I looked down at Brandon and I said, Brandon, I vow to you. I vow I will not be a loser. I will not give up. And I will follow it all the way through. And I didn't give up. That fall, Brandon and I went to community college. I remember all summer feeling this, feelings of panic come and go. There were times where I wanted to turn back the clock and say, no, I'm not going to college. And when those moments came, I heard Zig saying, do not give up. And so the first day arrived. And I did what I always did. I put on my black leather jacket, my Metallica t-shirt, my heavy black eyeliner, and I made my hair as big as possible. <laughs> and on the way to school, that old familiar friend, those negative tapes, started blaring loudly in my ear. You're a loser. You're a burnout. You're fat. You're ugly. You'll never amount to anything. Who do you think you are? And it took everything in me to pull into the parking lot of North Hennepin Community College. I remember the slow walk to class that day. And as I approached the door, I opened the door a little bit and I peeked in and I knew I did not belong here. Inside were beautiful, cool kids. They had shiny new backpacks and light, bright, shiny things. I was a burnout. I was a loser. I was a single mom living on $437 a month in the projects. I didn't fit. But before I could leave, the professor came in and started class. So I quickly grabbed a seat. And as I grabbed my bag to take out my notebook, I, I set the notebook down on the desk. And I happened to glance down. And in the metal spiral, there were two dead bugs. I lived in the projects. The exterminator had been losing the battle. I was mortified. I looked around quickly to see if anybody saw, and when I realized nobody was paying attention to me, I threw that notebook in the bag, and I flew out the door. And I vowed I would never come back to college. I went home that day and I cried and I was angry and I sat in my pajamas, curled up in the fetal position, vowing that I would find another way to get off welfare. That I would figure out how to move out of the projects without a college degree. And yet I knew without some kind of education, I would never get off welfare. That night, I really wrestled with my dreams. Did I want it? Did, would I ever be a motivational speaker? Would I be an author? Would I live in Maine? Would I be a lobster woman? Did I even want those things? And would it be enough to just not be a loser? Towards morning, I, I heard those familiar tapes kicking in. The ones that said, do not give up. And I didn't give up. It was hard. But I graduated from that community college. And I went on to get a bachelor's degree. And then 10 years ago, I moved to Maine. 
I moved to Maine, and I had no idea that moving to Maine would bring me back to a community college. Shortly after I arrived through a chain of events, I was asked to teach a marketing class at Southern Maine Community College. I was thrilled. They chose me. They asked me to be the teacher. And I couldn't even believe it. I said yes without even thinking about it. But the first night I drove onto this campus, I was terrified. The tape started in. Were you smart enough? Who did you think you were? And what if they don't like you? Well, they didn't like me that first night. When I get nervous, I talk way too much <laughs> and way too fast. And that's exactly what I did that first class. I blasted those poor students with more information than they could take in in an entire semester. <laughs> and I left feeling like crap. I felt completely defeated. And as I thought about it that next week, it hit me. I'd forgotten to share my story. I had forgotten to show up real. I don't have seven steps. I don't have a magic formula for change. And I don't have any brilliant how-tos. I have a story. A story about walking it all the way through. A story about not giving up. So that next week, I returned to campus. And I shared my story. The whole story. The real story. Our stories have power. Your story has power. My story has power. Our, powers have, or our stories have the power and the ability to connect us in a way that content never could. Our stories inspire us. They encourage us. They push us to dream big dreams. And many of you in here, I've heard your stories. And they inspire me. I have heard stories on this campus of students overcoming huge obstacles to get a college degree. I have heard stories of students courageously writing a new ending to their current story. You inspire me. It takes guts to write a new ending to your story. It is not easy. People will tell you it can't be done. People will say, who do you think you are? Those negative tapes will play. And life will be hard. But every single day, you have a choice. Will you go after your dreams? Will you follow it all the way through? I am so glad that I followed it all the way through. That I honored the vow that I made to my son. And what I'm really grateful for is I still have dreams. I had dreams as an eight-year-old little girl listening to Zig Ziglar. And I have dreams today as a 46-year-old grandmother. And I have no doubt I will be dreaming until I take my last breath. If you have dreams, I'm here to tell you one thing that I know for sure. It's not the seven simple steps. It's not the how-tos. The how one thing that I absolutely know for sure is it is possible that dreams do come true. Will it be easy? No. Will it be hard? Yes. So if you're sitting here today, if you came in here today thinking, I'm ready to give up, or this is too hard, I want to encourage you to stay with those dreams, to not give up on them. Do not give up on yourself. Do not give up on your dreams. And no matter what, do not give in to those negative tapes. It will be hard, but it will be worth it, no matter what you do. Do not give up. Thank you.